I dream of these people every night. The only thing I worry about is that some total unknown that nobody ever heard of comes along. <laughs> It is so great to be back. It's so great to be back here with you all. This is my 23rd time in Iowa, first with a bus, the bus that the people built. Every time I come to Iowa, I get fired up because the future of the country lies in your hands. I know right now you're living your lives, you're going to school. Every once in a while a presidential candidate comes through. If you can't escape the ads, I apologize. I'm not one of the worst offenders, you know that. I'm, I'm, I'm like right there in the middle, in the acceptable range. The reason why we all come to you, the reason I get fired up every time is that you have outsized power in our country, in our political machine. Most Americans look up and they see the pipes of government clogged with millions and millions of dollars of lobbyist cash, and they despair that there is nothing they can do about it. And Americans are very smart. Generally speaking, there is nothing they can do about it. But there is something you all can do about it. I did the math. Do you know how many Iowans, so do you know how many Californians each Iowan is worth? <laughs> 1,000 Californians each. That's right. You look around this junior high gymnasium tonight, I don't see 300 Iowans. I, I see 300,000 Californians. That's like seven football stadiums full of Californians right here. That's the power in this room. This is the power to take our country and turn it in a new direction just like that. That's why it's always invigorating to be here. The question is, what are you going to do with this power? What vision will you take to the rest of the country in 2020? You all know I'm not a politician. I don't think you mind that, for the most part. I'm an entrepreneur and problem solver, and I'm running for president because of the problems that got Donald Trump elected in the first place. Why is Donald Trump our president today? How did he win Iowa by eight points? And this is a really purple state. This is sort of a blue town, too. So, you're, you, so you probably reacted quite negatively when Donald Trump won, I'm imagining. If you turned on cable news, why would you think that Donald Trump's our president today? Russia, FBI, racism, Hillary Clinton, emails, Facebook, right, all mashed together into some strange cocktail. I think many of you know different. The reason why Donald Trump's our president today is that we blasted away four million manufacturing jobs. And where were those jobs? Michigan, Ohio. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, and 40,000 right here in Iowa. And I've been to the towns here in Iowa that have never recovered from the closing of their plant. That's when blue goes to red. That's how a purple state goes to Trump by eight points. And the forces that close those manufacturing plants throughout the Midwest are now reaching your main streets. How many of you have seen stores closing around where you live here in this part of Iowa? And why are those stores closing? Amazon, one word answer. $20 billion out every single year, they're sucking it up. How much did Amazon pay in taxes last year? <laughs> that is your math, Iowa, $20 billion out, zero back. 30% of your stores and malls closed for good. Most common job in your communities, retail clerk. 39 year old woman making between nine and $10 an hour. What does she do when her store closes? When you all call the customer service line of a big company and you get the bot or the software, I'm sure you do the exact same thing I do, which is you pound zero, 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 say human, 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 until you get someone on the line, right? How many of you all do that? <laughs> all of us. That software is miserable. But in two or three short years, the software is going to sound like this. Hey, Andrew, how's it going? What can I do for you? It'll be fast, seamless, a little bit seductive. What is that going to mean for the two and a half million Americans who work at call centers right now making $14 an hour? 
How many of you have seen a self-serve kiosk in a fast food restaurant, like a McDonald's? They will be in every location in the United States in two years, and they're going to move to the back of the house. The rubber really hits the road when the self-driving trucks come to your highways, come to our highways. They're in bed. Yeah, they just did a cross-country route from California to Pennsylvania. They delivered 20 tons of butter. I have no idea why it was 20 tons of butter. <laughs> How many of you have been to Iowa 80 in Davenport? Yeah, they've got a mean buffet. It's a good value. You walk through the store, and then you're like, ooh, <laughs> cornucopia. <laughs> Iowa 80 talks proudly about how 5,000 people stop there every day. How many people will stop there when there are robot trucks that don't need a meal <laughs> taking our cargo back and forth? These are the reasons why Donald Trump's our president today. We're in the midst of the greatest economic transformation in our country's history, what experts are calling the fourth industrial revolution. When is the last time a politician said the words fourth industrial revolution to you all? Just now, that's right. And I'm barely a politician. These are the problems that got Donald Trump elected that are picking up steam. And my first move was not to run for president of the United States because I'm not insane, and I can prove it to you. You just met my wife. <laughs> Where'd Evelyn go? <laughs> it is. First thing I did is I went to our leaders in Washington, D.C., and I said, hey, Donald Trump's our president because tens of millions of Americans decided to take a bet on the narcissist reality TV star. Our economy is leaving more and more people behind. What are we going to do to help people manage this transition? It's certainly not immigrants that are causing these problems. It's technology and automation. And what do you think the folks in D.C. said to me when I asked, what are we going to do? Yeah, the big three responses I got from the folks in D.C. were these. Number one, we cannot talk about that, Andrew. Number two, we should study that further, Andrew. Number three, we must educate and retrain all Americans for the jobs of the future. That one, how many of you have heard a politician say something like that at some point on TV, right? And you heard that and you were like, yeah, pretty reasonable. But I said to them, hey, I looked at the studies. Do you all want to guess how effective government-funded retraining programs were for the manufacturing workers that lost their jobs to the Midwest? The Yang Gang know it's zero to 15%. <laughs> They're a total dud. And when I said that to the folks in D.C., you know what they said next? I guess we'll get better at it. And one person said something that led me here to you all tonight. He said, Andrew, no one here in D.C. is going to do anything about this. You are in the wrong town. Because fundamentally, this is a town of followers, not leaders. And the only way we will do anything about it is if you were to create a wave in other parts of the country and bring that wave crashing down on our heads. I'm so glad I had someone with me because you would think I was making that up, right? You'd think it's like, do people really talk like movie supervillains in real life? Turns out DC lobbyist and movie supervillain sort of <laughs> in the same. Yeah, there's like an overlapping set between those two. But I heard this and I said, challenge accepted. I will be back with the wave. And that was two years ago, Iowa. That was two years ago, and you're looking at the wave. This is the wave that's going to rewrite the rules of our 21st century economy to work for us, to work for our people. This is the wave that will enable us to, us to look our kids in the eyes and tell them that they are going to be all right. I started this campaign two years ago. No one had ever heard of me. You had never heard of me. <laughs> And I stand before you tonight, number five in national polls, to be the President of the United States. I stand before you tonight, one of the seven candidates to make the debate stage next week. And the lone candidate of color. I stand before you tonight having raised $10 million in increments of only $30 each last quarter. My fans are almost as cheap as Bernie's, but there are a lot of them. This is a very cheap and wholesome gang to join. 
Really? The initiation is like essentially zero. <laughs> like what it is. Yes, this is the wholesome gang of human beings that are going to show our fellow citizens that we can provide a new way forward for our people. And the vision that you all will take to the rest of the country on February 3rd, I know the first time you heard it, it sounded like it was too good to be true. That there was someone running for president who said everyone should get $1,000 a month. And I know where you're like, ha ha, that's a gimmick. Uh, I always call the Asian Oprah by one late night host. <laughs> but this is not my idea and it's not a new idea. Thomas Paine was forward at the founding of our country. He called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King, champion in the 60s, called it the guaranteed minimum income, and it is what he was fighting for for all Americans when he was assassinated in 1968. I had the privilege of sitting down with Martin Luther King's son in Atlanta after the last debate, and he said to me that this is what his dad was fighting for when he was killed. A thousand economists endorsed this in the 60s. It passed the U.S. House of Representatives twice in 1971, and then 11 years later, one state passed a dividend where now everyone in that state gets between one and two thousand dollars a year, no questions asked. And what state is that, Iowa? Alaska. And how do they pay for it? Oil. And what is the oil of the 21st century? Technology, Technology AI, self-driving cars and trucks, big data. A study just came out that said that our data is now worth more than oil. How many of you saw that study? How many of you have access to a Netflix password? There's a documentary called The Great Hack, and that study's in there. Raise your hand if you got your data check in the mail last month. Where did the data checks go if our data is now worth more than oil? They went to Amazon, Facebook, Google, and these trillion dollar tech companies that are paying either zero or near zero in taxes. Do you see the game, Iowa? You know what real power is? Real power is when you can keep people from talking about what's going on. That's the, the, the highest level of power. Just keep it off the agenda. How many stories have you seen about the fact that you have trillion dollar tech companies paying zero in taxes? Believe it or not, it is your power and your power alone to rewrite the rules so that Amazon's paying its fair share, that Facebook's paying its fair share, that Google's paying its fair share. And after we get our fair share from the biggest winners of the 21st century economy, the next step is to put that money into your hands in the form of the dividend. And after you get $1,000 a month starting in 2021, how are you going to spend the money in real life? So I heard healthcare, shopping, schools, rent. How many of you all are students? I bet some of you. Yeah, so we know where the money's going to go. It's going to go to your tuition. It's going to go to your textbooks. And the occasional night out. It's cool. Not every night out is a junior high gymnasium. <laughs> yeah. How much of the money would stay right here in Iowa? Most all of it, not all of it. You'd get your own Netflix password. <laughs> but most of it would stay right here in your communities, going to car repairs you've been putting off and daycare expenses and tuition bills and Little League signups. This is the trickle-up economy, Iowa, from our people, our families, and our communities up. And this is the vision that you and you alone can make real on February 3rd. I want you to be intoxicated with your own power. This really is the power that you have. You should walk out of here just feeling like you're seven feet tall, being like, look at me, I'm worth a 1,000 Californians. And as soon as you walk past another Iowan, you can say, you too are worth a 1,000 Californians. And let me tell you what you should do with that power. We have to rewrite the rules so that the work of moms around the country, like my wife Evelyn, actually has as much value as a hedge fund manager or a management consultant or an investment banker. Right now, we are following our economic indicators off a cliff. 
Record high levels of corporate profits. You know what else are at record highs in the United States of America right now? Stress, financial insecurity, student loan debt for sure, anxiety, depression, mental illness, even suicides and drug overdoses, all at record highs in this country. It has gotten so bad that America's life expectancy has declined for three years in a row. You know the last time that happened in America? The Spanish flu of 1918, a global pandemic that killed millions around the world. That is the last time this happened, Iowa. It is unusual, shocking even, for life expectancy to decline even once in a developed country. It ordinarily just goes in one direction. You're getting stronger, you're getting healthier, you're taking better care of your people. For it to decline once and then again and then again is almost unprecedented. Who knows what it's going to do in year four? Yet we're cheerleading record high corporate profits and our people are dying. We had a similar situation 10 years ago, a situation that led me to quit my job and start a nonprofit. And I give so much credit to Evelyn because she could legitimately be like, baby, when I met you, you were a pretty normal guy. You weren't like quitting your jobs and starting nonprofits and running for president or any of this jazz. And it's totally true. She <laughs> definitely would have run the other direction with this. Ten years ago, we had a similar choice. The choice was this. Are we going to bail out our banks or are we going to keep more Americans in our homes? And what did we choose that time? The banks. Do you remember voting for the $4 trillion bailout of Wall Street? No. I sure as heck don't. They called it quantitative easing and hoped we wouldn't notice. I found this so shocking I quit my job and spent seven years trying to make things better. Washington, D.C. today is the richest metro area in our country. What do they produce? They produce bad decisions, they produce lack of accountability, they produce corruption at this point. That's how you have a capital that's the richest in the country. They had a choice between the banks and the people, they chose the banks. I say this time, we're going to get in there and we're going to choose our people. What do you think, Iowa? And I talked to Evelyn about this when she looked at universal basic income and she said, how was this so mainstream in the 60s and 70s and now it takes the far out futurist Asian guy no one's ever heard of to mainstream it. And she asked, how, how did this happen? What happened in the intervening 50 years? And what happened in those 50 years is that we got collectively brainwashed into thinking that economic value and human value are the same things. That we're all meant to be inputs into this giant capital efficiency machine, and as soon as we lose value, then it's on us. If your town no longer has value, it's on you. And this is turning against us in unprecedented ways. It's turning us against each other. It's stressing us out. It's making it so that we ha are contorting ourselves more and more. And as the parents of a special needs child, I know very, very well that economic value and human value are not the same things. Yes. Now you hear this and some of you are like, well, how do we change this, Andrew? And this is the, the glory of it. As your president, it will be very straightforward for me to go to the Bureau of Economic Analysis and say, hey, GDP, 100 years old, really out of date kind of useless, has no relationship with how our people are doing. If GDP is setting record highs and people are dying earlier, which do you listen to? You listen to the people. So as your president, I will take GDP and I will modernize it to include things that would actually tell us how we are doing. How about our mental health and freedom from substance abuse? How about clean air and clean water? How about average student loan indebtedness and affordability? How about the proportion of Americans who can afford to retire with dignity and not work until the day they die? How about how many Americans can actually afford life-saving drugs instead of having to choose between insulin and heating oil? These are the measurements that will tell us how we're doing. And as your president, 
I will transform the definition of progress in our economy to things that matter to us. And then I will present the real numbers to you all at the State of the Union every year. I will be the first president to use a PowerPoint deck in the State of the Union. If you like that visual, you probably should join the Yang Gag. Again, it's always a joy to be here because if I was talking about these changes in any other part of the country, it would, it would be too good to be true. But here in Iowa, the future is what you make it. The future is what you will it to be. Uh, this is again one of the only places where democracy still works. And you here in Iowa know better than most anyone else the changes that have wreaked havoc on your communities. It started on your farms, then it went to your factories, now it's on your main streets. You all have to stop it before it hits your highways. This is your obligation, your power, your responsibility. Donald Trump became our president in 2016 because he got some of the problems right. He said he was going to make America great again, and what did Hillary Clinton say in response? <laughs> America is already great. You remember that, Iowa City? It's been three long years, hasn't it? That was not the right answer. We have to acknowledge the depth and severity and reality of the problems, but then we need real solutions that would actually improve our way of life. What were Donald Trump's solutions? He said, we're going to build a wall. We're going to turn the clock back. We're going to bring the old jobs back. And you know, Iowa City, we have to do the opposite of these things. We have to turn the clock forward. We have to accelerate our economy and society as quickly as possible for the real challenges of the 21st century. We have to evolve in the way we think about ourselves and our work and our value as people. And I am the ideal candidate for that job because the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. What does math stand for, Iowa City? That's right, make America think harder. That's your job. That's where you are going to lead us. You are going to let the rest of the country know it's not left, it's not right, it's forward. And that is where you're going to lead us in 2020. Thank you, Iowa City. Let's make history together. Let's fight for our children. And let's win this whole thing. Thank you so much. Let's give it up again for the future First Lady, my wife, Ellen Yang. Evelyn. I certainly married up. It's very, very clear. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, yeah, yeah. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, yeah, yeah. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, yeah, yeah.